Are you stressed, worried, anxious, confused? Life can be overwhelming. It can be easy to find ourselves spread thin and feeling defeated. When we're overwhelmed, we sometimes forget that God is in control of everything. So how do you overcome worry when you're overwhelmed? Let us learn how to overcome feeling overwhelmed and how we can experience God's peace in all walks of life. The idea of fear. Right now, the coronavirus is is there. We all know it. We all hear about it. Some of us feel overwhelmed by it. We're inundated. Things are changing at rapid speed, and we can feel overwhelmed. Now, overwhelmed is just a fancy word for fear. It's more sophisticated. People say, oh, I'm so overwhelmed in life. It sounds like you're this entrepreneurial person. You're just afraid. We all have fear. And what happens is at the root of the fear is the fact that we can't control things. We're afraid because we see the stock market doing this. We're afraid because we hear that all the staples in the grocery stores are gone. We're afraid because we hear that the coronavirus is spreading and it's going to get us. And so at the heart of that is that we can't control it. There are so many things that we cannot control, and that is the heart of fear. Something that's out of my control. Do you want to know why there's a run on toilet paper? It's because it's something you can control. And so you go there, and there's none left, and then it's out of control. (laughs) Or or why people buy milk and bread and food staples when uh, anything's happening, not just a coronavirus, a snowstorm's coming. Oh, got to go get bread and milk because you can control that. You can't control how much snow is going to get dumped on your front lawn or on the streets. So we try to grab control. And so this morning I want to talk about the idea of fear. Because fear can make us feel overwhelmed. And we we don't know what to do. We don't know how to handle it. And the reality is we all face fears in life. I don't know if you would be brave enough to stand up here and share your fears. Anybody volunteer? I I knew someone would. But actually, a company, uh, uh, an online company did this. They got about 100 people, and they filmed them sharing what their biggest fears are. And it's available online, so we just want to share what some of these people said were their biggest fears. What are you most afraid of? (sighs) God, I don't know. What am I afraid of? That's a hard question. I'm scared of fruit at the bottom yogurt. I'm scared of bees. I'm scared of stepping on slugs. Thunder and lightning. Really distant outer space. Needles. Getting shot. Cats. Adult sloths creep me out. Are we talking about like an object or are we talking about anything? Oh, well, I don't like failing at anything. Probably failure. Disappointing my mom. Not being successful. Sucking at life. (laughs) Everyone's afraid to fail. Not being happy. Being stagnant. Being mediocre. Being boring. No one finding me interesting. Being embarrassed. Fear of rejection, for sure. Disappointing people. Myself. 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 People talking behind my back. I'm afraid of getting bullied. I think the biggest thing I'm afraid of is letting my OCD get to me. When I try to think about infinity, it actually causes a certain reaction inside this. Like I get short of breath. New things are pretty scary, but also being homeless. Being poor and having nowhere to live. What else, what's the the thing you're most afraid of? Losing my family, especially my little brother. I have nightmares about that. Don't ever leave me, bro. I love you. My grandpa and grandma dying at the same time. What am I afraid of? Losing my family. Losing someone that I love. What are you most afraid of? Uh, Other than commitment. um, Thinking about kids and marriage, it all scares me. Anything bad happening to my daughter. I can barely breathe when I think about losing one of my kids. CPS taking my kids from me. Being alone. Like, if no one else was on the planet. Not having someone to really love, to spend my entire life with. Being forgotten. I don't think it's required that somebody remember me, but I will feel sad to know that I'm gonna be pretty invisible. Strangers. You never really know what they're capable of. Someone showing up and going after you. Being attacked by people or being hurt, because like I've been hurt before, 
it might pass by people. When there's like too many people in a room. Dense crowds. Small spaces. Not being able to see this far in front of my face is not okay. It's like sensory deprivation pitch black. I'm afraid of the unknown. Zombies. I don't like demons or like anything spiritual. The devil. God. I'm only afraid of God. Ghosts. I was trying to sleep and then I hear something move and I'm like, whoa. Snacks maybe? Uh, spider? Spiders. Being stung. Oh, right now it's gotta be flying. Moment that plane is in the air, I am terrified of hitting the ground. Uh, I have a fear of heights. Falling. Falling on the sidewalk, breaking my teeth, and having my eyeball punctured. The freeway. Traffic and car accidents. The odds of it happening are so high, that is my number one fear. What are you afraid of? Earthquake. Being buried alive. So I always think about like stashing water underneath my desk in case the house falls down. I don't want to be on fire. Not a fan of water. The ocean, because it's like space, but on Earth. Sharks. Sharks. Drowning. Drowning. I'm like afraid of dying without having ever really lived. Growing old. Death. Death. Dying. Dying. Without having to live my best life, I guess. What are you most afraid of? Um, that we're not living in a simulation, and this is real. Well, I don't know what you thought about their answers, but I know this, we all, we all wrestle with fear. Fear is something we all deal with. It may be fear of what's happening right now in the world. You may say, I'm not worried about that, but we all deal with fears. And the Bible talks about the fact that we're not called to be afraid. As a matter of fact, in 2 Timothy, it says this, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If you're a follower of Jesus, he says, don't live in fear. I've not called you to be afraid. I've called you to live with the spirit of power. We can walk in power, the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. We can walk in love. We can give grace, mercy, forgiveness, tenderness, even when it seems radically different to what we should do. And we can have a sound mind. We can make, uh, use our minds to walk in wisdom, discernment, understanding, so we don't need to be afraid. As a matter of fact, the term, do not be afraid, is found about a hundred times in the Bible. Do not be afraid. More than that, the, the, the idea of do not fear, Rick Warren studied it out. He said there are 365 do not fears in the Bible, one for every day, because we, are, we, we deal with fear on a regular, consistent basis. But when the Bible talks about do not be afraid. Do not fear. It's not necessarily saying the emotion of fear, the, um, the, the gut reaction of being afraid at any given moment is wrong. In other words, there is such a thing as healthy fear. Healthy fear. Healthy fear is that thing internal, inside of us, that's, caused to, that, that's there to protect us. So you're living in an area where tornadoes are frequent, and the alarm goes off and you look outside and the sky has that unusual tint to it. And you hear the sound of a, a, a railroad car coming towards you. And you feel afraid. What does that feeling do? It says, run to the tornado shelter. That's not a bad thing. That, that's a good fear. It's the same thing inside of us that says we're going to put smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors in our homes. Because we want to be safe. It's the same thing that says I'm going to wear my seatbelt when I drive. So those fears are good. They, they actually are meant to protect us. So fear is this. Fear is a cause to pause. Fear is a cause to pause and say, God, what would you have me do? How would you have me react? How would you have me respond to this situation I'm in? So of these 365 do not fears in the Bible, the reason God says do not fear is because there was something for them to be afraid of. He was calling them to new territory. He was challenging them in an act of obedience. They were going out into battle. God was giving them a message to proclaim. They were facing persecution. And in those moments, fear came and it caused them to pause. And they would cry out to God, God, are you in this? God, would you have me do this? God, is this really what you're calling me to do? And 365 times, he says, yes, I'm in this. Do not be afraid. So healthy fear causes us to pause and reflect. But if there's healthy fear, there's also this, unhealthy fear. 
Unhealthy fear is when we fixate on what we're afraid of. It's all we can see. It's all we can talk about. It's all consuming. It causes us to simply look at that fear and be overwhelmed by it. I know people that live in a perpetual state of fear. They're, they're afraid of everything. Constantly, I mean, just afraid, afraid, afraid. That's unhealthy. God doesn't want us to live like that. See, unhealthy fear, if healthy fear is a cause to pause, unhealthy fear causes paralysis. And you've heard the term, you know, the paralysis of fear. You're, you're paralyzed by fear. What happens is all we do is look at this and we're just, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. I'm so scared. And so it causes us to stop risking, to stop trying, to stop believing, to stop stepping out in faith because we're so scared. It causes us to stop loving, to stop committing, to stop forgiving because all we are is overwhelmed by the fear. Unhealthy fear magnifies what makes you afraid and minimizes everything else so that all you can see is this fear. This fear is so very, very big and everything else is so very, very small. So you're afraid that something is going to happen to your family, something horrible. And so the fear of something bad happening minimizes the reality that you have a wonderful family. You're blessed with a great husband or wife. You've been given these amazing children. But you can't even appreciate them because the fear something might happen to them. And that's not how God wants you to live. And the thing that minimizes most is the power and the presence of God in your life. And as Christians, as believers, as followers of Jesus, we're called to magnify the power and the presence of God in our lives. So there's this story. Jesus is here on earth, and he's with his disciples. And this, this interaction happens. He's leading them, and he gets them on a boat. And here's what it says in Matthew 8. When he, Jesus, got into the boat, his disciples followed him. So don't lose track of that. Jesus, God in the flesh, is leading them into this situation. They followed him. Sometimes you follow God and you end up in places you never imagined. <clears throat> they followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he, Jesus, was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you Afraid, oh you of little faith. Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. I don't know what a great calm is, but I know this. If you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling afraid, if you're feeling anxious, God wants to bring a great calm into your life. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? In that story, there's... Three amazing truths that we find about fear. And the first thing is this. There's the reality of fear. Fear, listen, there was a real storm. And it was really swamping the boat. This was, this was a reality. So everything we talk about this morning, about not being afraid, it's not a denial of reality. We have to embrace this, the situation we're in. There was a, there was a real storm on a real lake, with real people, with real waves. And they, they had the real possibility of drowning. So, so fear is real. There, there is a reality of fear. You are going to be in situations that are terrifying. If you're afraid right now because of the headlines and the coronavirus, that's a legitimate fear. There is a virus going around. People are getting it. People are dying. That's, that's a reality. We can't just wish it away. Wave a wand and say, I'm just, uh, uh, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. That, that's not reality, folks. There are, there are things that happen in our world, and we have to be honest with them. There's the reality of fear. But then there's something even better than that, and that's this. The reality beyond fear. There is a reality beyond fear. So here's the disciples, and they're on the boat. And there's a reality beyond the fear. God is with them. God's with them. There's fear, and there's a storm, and all those things are real, but there is something greater than that. Jesus said, follow me out of the boat. They get onto the boat. He leads them into this storm, and it's as if they forget that Jesus was there. But we have to remember there's a reality beyond the fear, and that reality, if you're a follower of Christ, is this, the presence and power of God. His presence and his power are with you. Jesus didn't leave the boat. Jesus was there in the boat with them. 
The very presence of God incarnate is in the boat. And what's he doing? Sleeping. And it's not because, like, God is tired. It's because he's saying, if my power and my presence are here, why do you need to be afraid? Why? You've seen me heal people. You've seen me raise the dead. You've seen me feed the thousands. Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? And that's why he says, you're little, you men of little faith, he wasn't making fun of them. He's saying, why have you forgotten that my power and presence are with you? And so for us, what that means is there's a reality beyond the fear. Sometimes we allow fear to hold us back. If the disciples had known they get in the boat, there's going to be a storm, they probably would have not gotten on the boat. So many of us won't take the steps that God's calling us to take. We won't take, make the commitments he's asking us to commit. We won't give the things he's asking us to give. We won't be the person he's asking us to be. We won't declare the truth he's, he's asking us to declare because we're worried where will it lead us. And I'm telling you, God, if you follow God, it will sometimes lead you into uncertain territory. But remember this. Get this deep down in your heart. Never let fear hold you back from doing what God wants you to do. Never let, because there's a reality beyond the fear. And so often we hold back. Well, I'm in this relationship. I know it's unhealthy. I, I know we're, we're not married and we're having sex. I know we're behaving in ways that are inappropriate. But I'm just not willing to give that up. What if I can't find someone else? I know God wants me to end that relationship. But I'm afraid if I do, what if I don't find someone else and so we hold back doing what god wants us to do because of fear i know god asks me to give 10 percent back to the local church but what, what if i can't pay my bills what if god isn't enough and so we let fear hold us back i know we're supposed to forgive i know we're supposed to be loving i know i'm supposed to be gracious that person hurt me so bad i'm afraid if i forgive them they'll hurt me again and so we don't do what god asks us to do and we hold back. I, I know the truth. I know how I'm supposed to live. I know the things that I'm supposed to stand for and, and, and stand against. But what if my friends reject me? So we let fear hold us back. And God says, don't forget there is a reality beyond the fear. If you, we, if you refuse to step into that because of fear, it will limit Living the life that God wants you to live. Accomplishing the purposes he has for you. Because fear holds you back. So there is the reality of fear. There's the reality beyond the fear. And then there is this. You have to learn to trust in the reality beyond the fear. Yes, there's a reality beyond the fear. And we have to learn to trust in him. We have to say, God, you, your power and your presence are the reality beyond any fear that I have. I will trust in you. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. I've done that. I've had these fears. I've faced these fears. I said, I'm going to step out and follow God, and I'm going to stand against those fears, and things went haywire. It didn't get better. It got worse. It got all bumpy and crazy, and, and things didn't go smooth. I've tried that. It didn't work. Remember, God called the disciples onto the boat knowing there was going to be a storm. Sometimes God calls us to do something, and folks, I'm telling you, when you trust in the reality beyond the fear, you're still going to face bumps in the road. So here's this guy, Peter, another time. He's out on a boat, and he's with the, a bunch of the disciples. Jesus sends them off ahead of him. He spends the, the, some, some hours in prayer up on a hillside. And so he sends them. He says, leave, I'll, I'll catch up with you. They don't ask how. They just say, okay. Off they go. Go on the other side of the lake, and a storm hits. The storm hits, and they are afraid. They're worried that they're going to die. This is a recurring theme for these guys, fear. But you know what? Because it's a recurring theme for us. So there they are, and then Jesus shows up walking on the water. He's just going out on a stroll, and they're like, whoa. We see somebody walking. We think it's Jesus, but maybe it's, a, maybe it's some kind of demon. Maybe it's some kind of ghost. Is that really you, Jesus? And so this is what it says. Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out on the water. Okay, there's a lot there. First of all, if you think it's a demon, and he says, come to me, oh, then it must be Jesus. Secondarily, catch the, the greater truth. Jesus says, yes, there's a storm. There's all this 
whirling around you. All this fear, all this uncertainty, all these things that can make you feel overwhelmed. Come to me. Step out in the midst of this and come to me. He says, uh, Lord, if it's you, command me. Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Fear came back. And he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him. There are times when you will be called into some area beyond the fear that you're feeling. God says, move past the fear. Don't let the fear hold you back. Trust in me. And we say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to get out of the boat. I'm going to walk to you. And as soon as you step on the water, you think the waves will stop, the wind will stop, everything will be cool, and it'll just be an easy stroll right to Jesus. But that's not the reality. The reality is we step out in, in spite of the fear, in spite of everything happening around us, and we walk. And there are times where the fear still overwhelms us. But I'm telling you this, part of what makes obeying God an act of faith is moving beyond your fear. It's moving beyond your fear and saying, in the midst of everything happening, God, you didn't calm the storm. You said, walk in the storm. I'm going to step to you. And then even if the fear overwhelms you, remember, you're trusting in the reality beyond the fear. Do you trust that if fear rears up, And you begin to sink. Is God there, ready to reach out and hold you? Or do you say, well, if God calls me out, he's not going to be there to bail me out. God called me out, but I don't trust him to save me. Peter didn't yell back to the guys in the boat, hey, throw a life preserver. He cries out to Jesus, save me. And Jesus reached out. God is always ready. If you step out beyond your fear and trust in the reality beyond your fear, God is there to save you. Why? Because God is greater. God is greater than any fear you face. God is greater than any circumstance you go through. God is greater than anything. We can't lose sight of that. God is greater. There are times when he will call us, challenge us. He will ask things of us. And we'll say, I don't know if I can do that. But God is greater. God is greater than all those things that we face. But it's easy to say, "Ah, I don't know if I can trust God. In that reality. But it's what he calls us to. It's what he asks us to do. He says to you and to me, will you trust in the reality beyond the fear? Yes, I know the headlines. Yes, I know what's happening. But will you trust? I have not given you a spirit of fear. I have given you a spirit of power, and of love, and a sound mind. So it's easy. It's easy to get overwhelmed because what we tend to think is, but what if the worst happens? What if I get the coronavirus? What if I die? What if someone I know gets the coronavirus? What if they die? Oh, I can't think of anything worse. Listen, I'm not making light of this. Please hear me. I am not making light of this. It would be horrible for someone you know and love to die regardless if it's from the coronavirus or any other way. Death is not a fun thing. But here's the, here's the reality. If I could put my pastoral hat on and sit with you one-on-one, I, what I would say is none of us are getting out of this life alive. That's a 100% guarantee. We're all, we all are gonna, we're all gonna die at some point. I know there'll be that generation that's here when Jesus comes back and you can get into the theological ridiculousness of that. I'm just, can I just say, the reality is the vast, vast majority of are going to face death. Our loved ones are going to face death. It's what, it's what this world has become because of sin, sickness, and disease. It's not the way God designed it, but it's the reality of it. So back 72 years ago, there was a theologian, a scholar, well-known. You've probably heard of him. His name was C.S. Lewis. 72 years ago, he wrote an essay, and he titled the essay, Living in an Atomic Age, because at that point in history, the atomic bomb was new on the scene. And it was overwhelming people with fear. You talk about fear. People were worried the bombs were going to launch and the world was going to be annihilated. And so he wrote this essay. And C.S. Lewis is brilliant, far smarter than I can ever pretend to be. And, and what, what I've done is all I've done in this essay, part of this essay, 
is I've removed the term atomic bomb and replaced it with coronavirus. Now, let's see what his words then speak to us now. How are we to live in light of the coronavirus? I am tempted to reply, why? As you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year or as you would have lived in the Viking Age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat on any night or indeed as you are already living in an age of cancer, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railroad accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the coronavirus. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because we have added one more chance of a painful and premature death into a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. The first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by the coronavirus, when it comes, let it find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint. You, you, pint of what? You can fill in the blank. <laughs> and a game of darts. Not huddled together like frightened sheep thinking about viruses. See, viruses may break our bodies, but they need not dominate our minds. Now, that's what God's called us to. Yes, there are fears out there. Yes, they're real, but we don't need to be dominated by them. The disciples were in a boat. There was a storm, but Jesus was with them. All they needed to do was remember that God's power and God's presence was there with them. All they needed to do was remember that there was a reality greater than their fear. And Jesus says, peace, be still. And we can do the same thing. We can do the same thing today if we'll remember, regardless of the fear that we're facing, there is a reality beyond our fear, and we can trust in that reality. I don't know what you're afraid of today. It could be the coronavirus. It could be that you look at your retirement account and say, well, I'll never be able to retire now. It could be the fact that God's calling you to a greater commitment. He's asking you to obey in some way. He's calling you to do something you don't want to do. He's asking you to give beyond what you're comfortable giving. He's asking you to go somewhere that you don't want to go. I don't know what it is that you're afraid of today, but I do know this. You and I need to look our fear in the face. Look right at it. There's a reality of fear. And then say, there is something greater than this fear. There is something beyond this fear, and I choose to trust in that. What we need to tell ourselves time and time again is this. I may be afraid, but God is greater. I may be terrified, but God is greater. I may think that the world is going to end, but God is greater. And if we can't hold on to that, fear will dominate our minds. And that's not what God has for us. So I'm going to ask if you'd stand. I want to pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. God, I don't know what fears each individual here is facing, but I know this. You tell us time and time again, fear not, do not be afraid. I'm with you. There is a reality beyond the fear. So God, I'm asking that you would calm our hearts. You would settle us right now by your Holy Spirit, who is the great comforter. God, you are the Prince of Peace. And I'm asking for your peace in a world where we feel overwhelmed, in a world where the headlines come at us in rapid fire succession and threaten to drown us like a tsunami, God, I pray peace. That we would cry out, not to other people on the boat and save us. We would cry out to you, save us, Lord. Who else can we turn to? Who else has the words of life? God, we can turn to a lot of things for a sense of peace. 
And I thank God for doctors. I thank God for the medical profession. I thank God for civil leadership. But God, we can't cry out to them, save us. We cry out to you, save us. So God, I'm asking, in the midst of our fears, will we remember, I may be afraid, but you are greater. May we call out to you, find peace in the storms that we face in life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.